Hey guys, Happy New Year, Happy 2020, thanks for dropping by my channel. Uh, Do More is all about uh, three things. One is to be a better investor, uh, the second thing is to be a better entrepreneur, and the third thing is to be the best person that you can be. So for this session today, I talked to a guy called Dr. George Lee. He's whom I would call and describe as Malaysia's only rock star doctor. And he's had a celebrated career as a urologist, but he's also at this point in his life where he's doing amazing things with his own personal um, existence, going traveling, and he's got lots of advice to young people and old people alike about uh, all the things that matter to you. If you like this video like I did doing it, please like it, share it, and comment on it. Thank you for coming by. Dr. George Lee. <laughs> there can only be one, right? Of course. Um, big, big honor, big privilege uh, to have you big here. Big personality. Big personality. Um, you're a urologist, what you used to call a willy doctor. Well. <laughs> um, but before that, before the willy doctor nurse, um, who, who are you? Where have you come from? And were your parents willy doctors too? All <laughs> right, okay. Well, <laughs> parents is like my era. Well, born in the 60s, yes, in the right? midst of the jungle of Gotabaru. Right, okay, so 1969, very good year. Good Fantastic vintage. year. Fantastic. Maybe the best ever. Absolutely. You know, even a song about it. Right, of course, summer of 69. Brian Adams. Absolutely. And summer of love. That's right. Sadly for our country, it's also a very dark history. Right, May 13. And I, I was born about two weeks before May 13. And then, uh, you know, I remember dad uh, told me stories that uh, with all these um, chaos that was going on after I was born, was uh, given to a Malay village. My mom took me to a Malay village, but actually nothing happened in Kelantan. Because if for those of you who've been to Kelantan, you'll realize that it's a very harmonious place. You know, the uh, Chinese speak Kelantanese, we eat wudu, and then for Chinese New Year, very recently we have nasi dagang on the first day of Chinese New Year, and then the Malay will go and see a Thai monk, and Chinese will see Tok Bomo. It's a very, um, I would say, quite a interesting. Um, melting pot for cultures. Why is that? Because Kelantan, if we can just digress a little bit, Kelantan is um, not exactly Barisan National or Pakatan Harapan, right? It's, well, it's Before it's, that, it it's, was... It's, it's past, right? It, it, it's, indeed, it's undeveloped, yeah. it's hinterland, it's rural. But in the 60s, it wasn't. In the 70s, it wasn't. That's why in the 60s, you have Pantai Cinta Brahi. And then later on, after past took over two decades later, and then uh, it became Pantai Chai Bulan. So you can imagine during that time, Thai border, you know, it was, uh, you know, people always talk about Sungai Golok. That's a cultural melting pot in the 60s and 70s. And then, so I, um, you know, grew up in the 60s, uh, uh, well, born in 69, grew up in the 70s, went to a Chinese school. So I would say I have best of three worlds, right? Of course, uh, you know, have the Kelantanese uh, voodoo culture and then, um, so most of the time we get stopped by police. Mo nobody can believe that, you know, this uh right? Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, right? So you have no idea what I'm talking about. I just about. did what well, kind of kind of you yeah, yeah. suss it out, right? Okay. And of course Chinese school in uh Kotabaru we have a very small community of Chinese, probably about seven percent Chinese. One street that uh probably designated for Chinese to have uh, non halal food. And then um, we have Chonghua and Chongcheng. I went to Chonghua, which of course is a better one. And then uh, until the age of um, 16. And so, you know, I, I felt that those were really one of the few things that probably shaped my character. Is that characters of being resilient, is that personality, is that adaptability, is that glantanese-ness. And then so you really need to survive wherever uh, the wind takes you. And I really think that was what probably shaped my personality. And of course, after that, it took me to UK, um, 1986, in the midst of uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland. Probably from your research, you didn't realize that. That's I, right. I went and studied in Northern Ireland for four years. The IRA the in those the days. The IRA in those <clears throat> days. If you go to Marks and Spencer's in Belfast, you get, uh, have to go through uh, barricades because you have no idea whether you'll be bombed or not. That's right, that's and right. Then, yeah. And then those are the time during recessions. Margaret Thatcher time, uh, interest rate 17%, perfect time to send your kids because 
with a bit of FD, you can actually sustain your kids' lifestyle and allowance for many years. That's right, that's right. A lot of people did that in the 80s, late 80s with Australia as well. That's right. Fixed deposits were about 15%. Indeed. And a lot of people sent their money over there and just bought and a house. They bought a house and my, uh, my dad just said goodbye. Yeah. And it essentially left me there for four years. So were your parents doctors as well? No, my dad uh, actually run a bicycle shop and then, uh, you know, eventually... Um, uh, under Bunsiu, actually a, a Honda dealer in motorbike. And after that, Kamoto became a Honda dealer. Um, quite a prominent uh, family in Kotobaru. And then with the Lees, and then we have Lee Motos, we have, uh, you know, Banchubi, which is my dad's kind of like a, you know, um, business background. And also another brother who actually l- uh, owns Lee and Key, which was the for securities in the uh, 70s. Uh, which was the, um, uh, for the stock exchange in the 70s. So that's so quite a prominent family, uh, but my dad was the youngest. Uh, my dad believed in investment in education, right? Okay, um, at that time when I was a kid, uh, under the very um, influence of uh, an Irishman who actually was the tutor of our previous king, same age as me, and then uh, essentially said to me, look, this kid needs to go abroad and he needs to have that uh, seasoning of uh, the Western culture. Then that's why my dad just sent me in 86, uh, spent four years in a small school in uh, outside Belfast, a place called Lisbon. Went to a Lisbon, c- correct. Fantastic. Not Lisbon, but Lisburn, B-U-R-N. I see. I see. And then uh, went to a Quaker school Amazing. Uh, you know, I'm giant. amazed. Maybe that's why you turned out the way you did. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Quakers are extremely conservative, right? If you see anyone who knows me, the flamboyantness of Dr. G, you would think that the Quakerness probably didn't instill too much into me. Yeah. Um, went to Quaker school um, for four years. And during that time, obviously, a very tough time for me because first time in your life, comfort of Kotabaru, the food and everything, suddenly being sent to the tip of the United Kingdom on the uh, Irish uh, uh, um, island side. And Northern Ireland was an easy place to live. And for years, uh, you know, for four years, I uh, endured the trouble years and then also um, didn't come back and I had to do a lot of farming. You know, those days, uh, yeah. part study, part work, you know, to yeah. sustain your life. And I did a lot of that. You know, uh, um, Christmas, uh, holidays, Easter's, work in a farm and enjoy that. But Yeah, it it's tough. interesting because those times in Ireland, they were called the Troubles, weren't they, right? Absolutely. And that was the arsenal of the UK. Indeed. But you went into, the, into urology, which is an interesting branch of medicine, which I'm quite interested in because in the past, I've talked to other doctors like Dr. Teo of Cancer yeah. Research. And um, I think it resonates a lot of people, among people, our vintage, right? Because obviously, we're coming to that time when mm. we've got to have a bit of... Um, analysis about what's wrong with us and and I mean obviously beyond your you know your your theatrical and your performance your performer side you know a lot about this stuff and a yes. lot, if you as you said men in, in in the newspapers you said that men tend to be quite quiet about these things mm. about their org- organ issues and you know uh, in in your line of work how, how how big of an issue is it in men uh, well, of this, I mean, this age to be truthful um Urology has evolved quite significantly from the time I joined. I, after Northern Ireland, I went to Cambridge. Uh, I was in Cambridge for six years. And uh, initially in Cambridge, you do medical sciences and my degree was in pharmacology. Pharmacology is that effectively is looking at how cells work and how, manipulate, how to manipulate it using drugs and medications. After that, uh, I went to Oxford. Uh, in Oxford, I spent two years doing surgery and effectively during that time, you're still at early stage of your career, not really consolidating on what you're interested in. I mean, to be truthful, I mean, to be fair, I really venture into urology probably out of accident because um, at that time, I knew I wanted to do surgery. I didn't want to do something too uh, labor intensive because initially I was embarked in transplant surgery. You can imagine that you're always on call and it's quite a morbid subject because you're harvesting people's organ and then most of the time young individuals who die in a very tragic situation. I really found that a whole specialty took a toll on me. So I, during that time, found that urologists were doing transplant for kidneys 
And that's really when I started realizing urology is a wealth of specialties that really took my interest. A few things that really I loved about urology. Number one, we play with a lot of toys. I can see you have so many toys here. You're probably yeah, at the same frequency. <laughs> in urology, those days were the Atari days. You remember the kind of like a space invaders and everything. And that's when you actually use a lot of your mental, uh, you're kind of like a dexterity of uh, using a endoscope kind of like scenario. You're playing with something, but actually patients being operated on uh, on a separate uh, entity. So that's what I was interested in because I really felt that all my misspent youth on these computer games could be utilized in this. So a lot of technological advancement and we cover a lot of things apart from transplant, we deal with cancer in men, we deal with sexual health, we deal with pediatric urology, like, uh, you know, um, genital deformities, we deal with sex change, we deal with male infertility, we deal with female problems with recurrent infections. So I really find this whole wealth of subjects a real fascination. And then therefore venture into urology, spend the next 10 years in London, mainly in West London Imperial College rotations, and then, you know, like St. Mary's, Charing Cross, Hammersmith, and then those hospitals and really kind of nurture my interest and that was the part where I found out what you alluded to earlier that one of the interesting findings about mankind is that mankind is not very kind to men. I think you mentioned that before. Right, I elaborate that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things about men is that the society would like to portray us macho, uh, characters. It's like, you know, we don't cry very easily. We don't really admit to problems. And that nurturing of the characteristics tends to hold men back. So if you face with any form of obstacles in life plus health, let's say um, you are having a bit of pain uh, somewhere, your back, and then you're told to tough it out because uh, it should really uh, disappear, don't be so mamby pamby about it. And that itself might be a symptoms for something that is more serious. And when it comes to a situation where, um, let's say more serious things like men passing blood in the urine, technically that can be something serious, but men will probably hide it because out of fear, embarrassment, being laughed at. And that is one of the compromising factors about life is that women, were encouraged to go and see doctors much earlier. But men are discouraged to do so because of these uh, reservations. And I really think that is one of the reasons why life expectancy between men and women are significantly different. In every country around the world, from Swaziland to Japan, there is at least a five-year discrepancy in life expectancy. For example, Singapore, you know, women can live up to about 85, men can live up to 79. Every country, there's a five-year discrepancy. It's, I think, one of the key factors is not intrinsically genetic. It's because of treatment-seeking behavior. So men go and see doctors much later, therefore their success is compromised. So it's cultural and behavioral and not uh, anything much more scientific than that? Uh, in addition to that, I will give you a scenario. Men will service their cars before it gets damaged, right? So the cars need to be serviced. But men only go and see doctors when they're ill. Interesting findings? Yeah. Well, you will look after your car better than you look after your body. However, the healthcare is organized this way that it favors women. For example, a woman gets pregnant. They're not ill, but they go and see a doctor. When the child is born, they're not ill, but they have access to doctors. When they get into menopause, they're not ill, they have access to doctors. And when the child is having menses, menarche, they're not ill, they go see doctors. So the access to doctors is always there. So women don't necessarily go and see doctors when they're ill, but men only go and see doctors when they're ill. So by the time they're ill, the access to the doctors is already too late. So I think healthcare is designed to favor women, therefore it actually compromises on men's health. So on the basis that um, men is not, are not as preemptive in medical issues as women are, uh, what are some of the stuff, what are some of the issues that men should watch out for in terms of um, as they get into their 40s um, and to watch out for 
whether it's reproductive or whether it's urology mm. or anything else, yeah. like it can be anything, right? Okay. Because, because it's a big deal, right? Okay. I mean, without a doubt, men uh, harbors more high risk behavior. For example, men drive faster cars, therefore road traffic accidents more predominantly men. Men drinks more, smokes more, don't look after themselves, don't exercise as much as a woman. Probably these are the things that indulgence in life, I would say that you abuse your body before the age of 40. After the age of 40, your body will sure to abuse you back, right? So what you're asking is that all those comorbidities that you harvest before you're 40, beyond 40, what do you look out for, right? First of all, I think it's a good idea that you try to abuse your body a lot less when you can, <laughs> right? So that is called preventive medicine. That's intuitive. Absolutely. So afterwards, okay, you can't do much about it. For you and I, you can't do much about it, okay? I mean, a lot of people will know, right, from the days when I started doing the uh, BFM uh, doctor in the house, I was 108 kilo. Wow, right? that's right. a lot. Yeah, I'm 78 kilo now, okay? And it took me uh, probably one tragic motorbike accident later. On your Vespa? On my Vespa and ruptured my spleen, torn my liver and then had this huge amount of internal bleed later and then reaching the whole morbid age of 50 years old and realized that do I really want to live like this? Is it ever too late to change my lifestyle? Right, okay? Because I begin to admit, number one, throughout my life, I'm this Chinese school kid who just would never exercise because I spent all my life on academic achievement because my success were quantified by the accolades, by the achievement that I made, the trophies, right? And for those years, I felt that I was doing it for someone else. I wasn't doing it for me. I didn't look after myself. You know, if I had opportunity to run for a school um, athlete um, event, I will be the first one who fabricate a letter from my father to say that I was too ill in order to attend. And then that is a common scenario that we see. But all that inactivities, all that disinterest in sporting activities eventually will take its toll. And therefore, I am now catching up. And number one things that I really think the listeners needs to know is that it is never too late. If Dr. G can do it at the age of 50, I've just run a marathon at the end of last year. Okay, it took me like six hours and 50 minutes. A to full get marathon. A full 42 point. Bloody hell, well, hats off, man. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> Where'd you do that? Well, I know. Uh, oh, I did the standard chartered marathon. In no, KL. In KL, absolutely. Wow. Full marathon. I know. Mate, that's so, a big I mean, deal. I'm so, okay. <laughs> All my nails fell off afterwards. But, <laughs> hey, you know what? It's a sense of achievement, right? It's and not in a million year, I would imagine, not in a million year, you would think Dr. G would do a full marathon, right? Okay, for those of you who don't believe me, you can go to the website and check it, right? <laughs> I did do the full thing. I didn't cheat. I had multiple opportunities that I could cheat, but I said, look, if I do cheat, you cheat, you can cheat everyone else, or you can't cheat yourself, right? I'm now doing two cycling sessions, like, you know, bike indoor cycling, one in the morning, one in the evening. When on those days when Mira was nagging me and said, George, you really need to exercise, you need to really exercise, I never thought in the million years that that whole endorphin thing that you get addicted. That it's amazing. Factor. Yeah, it's an wow, amazing it's feeling. It's exerodating, right? Okay. Yeah. And I never thought it existed. I thought people lied about it. Well, mate, it's true. It and, is true. Uh, you should do it. And, and in fact, everyone should do it. But, exactly. um, but in terms of most men, right? The vast majority of guys who don't get that high from sports, um, especially in your line of work, right? Yeah. I think prostate is a big issue. Indeed. Uh, cancer of the, the colon, nether region, it, yeah. colon is a big issue. Um, what are some of the things that people should be aware of? Okay, Men. Right. The most basic things. Before you put anything in your mouth, diet, just be a bit mindful. People talk about mindfulness, right? Before you put anything in your mouth, there is a price to pay for it, right? We live in a lifestyle where we eat a lot of meat, we eat a lot of processed meat, we don't think about where that product comes from, we don't think about pesticides, we don't think about anything like that. I really think that we need to actually sayang our body a little bit more by actually be more mindful before you put anything in your mouth. Know 
something, you know, what is this going to do to you? So I think diet is by far the most important thing a lot of people need to be mindful of. So don't eat too much meat, cut down on carb, eat more fruit and vegetables. And I really think those are the absolute basic things that will help you to live a healthier life. Well, on the premise that big agriculture has got its dirty hands on most industry, whatever you eat nowadays is kind of like infiltrated, right? Absolutely. But, so but, how do you mitigate against but that? If, if you have that mentality, we can never get out of that because, you know, even the fruits we eat and the vegetables we eat have been sprayed, the leaves by God knows what kind of toxins. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm lucky that I lived through the years when I grew up in Cotabar. I fly back to see my mum probably every two to three weeks. Okay, that's part of my kind of reconciliations in life. When I reach 50, I said to myself that there are several three things that I want to do. I want to, I feel like first stage of my life with all that Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard School of Toxicology, all those accolades, I felt like it was the first stage of my life for achievement. Beyond that, I wanted it to be for myself. And then there are two people, two groups of people that I really want to reconcile with. Throughout our journey of life, maybe we have some sort of frictions and issues with our parents, right? My dad passed away about 17 years ago and I really felt, I, I was, I'm quite regretful of the many things I never really get to go and talk to him about and never really spend that time with him. I wrote two books about this in Chinese, right? One is called Sen Ming Mei Lu Guo. In life, there is no if, right? The other one is called Yi Yuan or the Wu Bang. Hospital is my utopia because when I look at patients or the family who had the opportunity to bring their parents to see doctors, I'm very envious of that because I never even have a chance to do that with my dad because I was chasing my dreams and I neglected them. So therefore, I made it a point that while my mom is alive, I want to do that. I want to do that because it's for the benefit for myself, right? During that time, I found the answer of your questions. Because you lived through the 70s, you knew during that time, our food is fresh from the market. You know, the vegetables, you know where it comes from. And in Kotabaru, we still have that. We still have the same machi who brings down the fruit and vegetable that she grew. And that is one of the beauties that I really enjoy, that go back to Kotabaru, back to the basic. Do you know why it still exists? Because there is a demand there. But when we have the mentality that everything is so interconnected, it's the commercial, globalization, it's beyond our control, then the market for the small farmers, the healthy food that we used to eat when you grow up, will never emerge and will never survive. So I dispute what you said, because eventually, if there's a will, there's a way. If truly you can't find it, then grow it yourself. Because eventually, you can't abuse your body that way anymore. All the pesticides you put in, all the hormonally antibiotic treated poultry, how many years do you want to carry on taking that? Well, you've been a doctor for 20, 30 years already, right? Obviously, you've, you've seen patients come and go. What are the trends, especially among your patients, right? Mm -hmm. Have, there's, have there been a prevalence, some pattern that's formed in terms of the stuff that you've seen and mm -hmm. treated? Yeah, okay. I mean, if you just look at death rate, for example, right, okay, cancer rate goes up quite significantly, right, okay, and the key cancer um, uh, prevalence are colonic cancer, uh, lung cancer. Due to diet, due to smoking? Absolutely. And then also prostate cancer, right? Okay. Prostate cancer can be due to three things. One is age. If you live long enough, there will be a small chance of you getting uh, prostate cancer. But most people die with prostate cancer rather than die of prostate cancer, right? What we want to know is that that dormant cancer, we don't want it to flare up. So we don't want aggressive cancer and we don't want it to get it too early. So for men who actually constantly eat uh, meat, they are more predisposed to it. So therefore, diet and lifestyle is the key reasons why. So we see younger and younger men get cancer. We see younger and younger men get diabetes. We see younger and younger men get uh, non-communicable diseases. 
but we don't see many people preempt to actually not get themselves into that situation earlier on. And I really think that needs to change. I mean, we're the fattest nation in the whole ASEAN. You, you mentioned three reasons why people get prostate cancer. Mm-hmm. One of them is obviously age. age. The other two? Genetic and diet. Okay, so in your opinion, and this is something that Dr. Tio Su Huang of Cancer Research has mentioned, what percentage do you ascribe genetics in terms of your ability to get cancer or not? Okay, the predominant genetic um, association with prostate cancer is BRCA genes, and it's the same genes that dictates the breast cancer. So for women, it transforms, causes mutations in the breast, and for men, it causes muta- mutations in the prostate. So. So you're referring to just prostate cancer or cancer generally? Uh, prostate cancer, specifically. So for men who has BRCA genes, they tend to get the cancer much earlier on because classically, a prostate cancer, men, a men who present with prostate cancer will present around the age of 65. However, men with BRCA genes may present in their 40s or early 50s. So those are the ones who get that. The number is very small because the people who have exposure to lifestyle and uh, you know high meat intake that is a big chunk of the prevalence we have studies to show that japanese men who lived a um, high fruit and fiber lifestyle in japan and moved to california uh, and started having big mac and burger king's lifestyle their cancer risk go up significantly within a few years and that's the evidence to suggest that the men who are big chunks of those who actually get cancer are, in many ways, is lifestyle induced. Okay, I read studies, and I'm not sure whether this is true. Is it that uh, suggests that cancer rates in America have been dropping for the last thirty years? Mm-hmm. Is that true? And and if so, why why does that why does that happen? Well, I. I find it difficult to... um, To agree? To agree, right? Okay. Um, It's because increasingly our technology to detect cancer goes up because the technology gets better and better. So detecting cancer should actually go up. So the cancers that we never detected before in the past, we make the diagnosis more. The second reason why I disagree with that data is that we live longer. When you live longer, you have a larger populations. When you have larger populations who are older, the risk of cancer goes up. So therefore, I find that study probably statistically manipulated to show for di- if you look at different parameters or you're looking at specific cancer, might be correct. But I find overall, the cancer rate due to detection is higher and uh, the population living longer by those two factors alone you're bound to find more cancer. Okay, so in a Malaysian context, especially in an Asian context, um, one is getting the sense that the numbers that we're getting, the research that we're seeing is very Western. Mm -hmm. It's very very specific to those regions and to those cultures and to those behaviours. But the Asian prevalence and the Asian preponderance for cancer cases is very specific to the cultures and diets and environments that that, uh, that we live in. In In your experience, in Malaysia, uh, where are the cases for, for men, for male cancers, and, and how are they being detected? What okay, kind of stuff? Right, okay, so I'll, I'll give you some example of culturally uh, biased towards Asian populations. For example, nasopharyngeal cancer, very much this part of the world because of uh, certain uh, uh, Epstein-Barr virus uh, that affects the, um, the nose. Those nasopharyngeal cancer is caused by a virus that actually cause uh, the, the, uh, the virus, uh, the transformations. The other virus that actually uh, can, or bacteria that is very prevalent in Asian setting is stomach cancer. Stomach cancer it uh, can be caused by a pathogen called Helicobacter pylori, so that's very much Asian orientated, right? Okay. Then a lot of people think that Asian culture of cooking, for example, the it's walk, not true. The walk is it true right? or not true? There are a lot of studies um, that actually highlighted the chakwitiao and the charcoals and then the walk. Actually, it's more prevalent to cause um, lung cancer because of the flame and also all that char. You, I think it's difficult for you to identify to say 100% related or not related. 
but there is some degree of correlation. Okay, because when I asked Dr. Teo about that, um, I remember her saying that there's very little, co- very little correlation. Yeah. The study shows association, right? Okay. For example, I'll give you something that um, gets all the men very excited, right? Okay. I'm surprised you haven't asked me that. Because, Not yet. Uh, right, okay. <laughs> right, I'm sure you, that puts smiles in your face. It says a number of ejaculations correlating with reductions of prostate cancer. I see. Okay. Yeah? okay. Okay. So it's a theory. So this is a study done in Harvard School of Tox- uh, uh, Harvard Medical School, essentially looking at about twenty to thirty thousand individuals, men, predominantly white, admittedly, in Massachusetts. These are healthcare providers, right? Okay, uh, physiotherapists, doctors, dentists, uh, nurses, men, and asked them to record their frequency of ejaculations. Uh, over three decades. So the more you ejaculate, the lower your chances. No, that's a of question I'm going to pose to you, right? Okay. okay. So the thesis, Error. the assumption is that the more you clear your pipes, yeah, in a well, way. Do you right? think that's true? Is that I, the assumption? I think it's. Well, I think there's a positive correlation. I.e., the more times you clear your pipes, the less chance you have of getting prostate okay, cancer. Okay. So, so, so your um, your theory is correct. And this is over three decades, and it's, it's a big study of more than 30,000 individuals recorded of three decades of ejaculatory frequency. And it's replicated in Australia, it's replicated in some European countries. So see, the more you ejaculate, the less chance of you getting prostate cancer. Now, to make this interview a little bit more interesting, how frequent is frequent, Mr. Chuang? <laughs> frequent is several times a week. Okay, several times is a vague figures. I want figures like, you know, like how would you define okay, four, five, four or five times out of seven. Per week? Per week. Four or five times a week. Yes. All right. You're, you're talking about like more than twi- uh, uh, daily, really, four or five times yeah, a week. Yeah, nearly right? daily. Yeah. Nearly daily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> you're nearly right. Okay, right. Actually, what the study show is that if you ejaculate more than 21 times per month, okay. you significantly reduce your risk of prostate cancer by uh, about 20%. Okay, 20% is not a lot though. 20% is a lot is when it? you kind of look reduction of prostate cancer. Okay. Right? I mean, you're talking about millions of men. Does calcification of the prostate amount to a higher risk of obtaining prostate cancer? No, no. But... What you're highlighting, it's a very interesting finding. Does calcification comes into this? Does the health of the person come into it? Because it's multifactorial. This study just has a headline saying, frequent ejaculation reduce your risk of prostate cancer. Yeah. Because the study is a robust study that shows the correlations. But when you look into the details of it, right? For men who ejaculate more frequently, tends to be more sexually active, Yes. tends to be more healthy, your testosterone is higher, your libido is higher, these are the men who probably exercise more, these are the white men, and all these are the factors that we're not taking into account. But the headlines, if you pin it down to frequency of ejaculation, correlations with frequency of prostate cancer, it's there. So when you look at other studies, when you look at correlations, the wok frying and the eating, and then you see that more frequent walk flying and then also cancer. But if you use charcoal in your house, you're probably of a poorer demographic of the individuals and household anyway, right? So your lifestyle probably uh, have to take on two jobs, have a lot of stress, have to bring up four children, have to wait like to, uh, work 15 hours a day, and that probably predisposes you to cancer anyway. But those studies cannot highlight these variables. So there is a study, but how robust is the study will never be revealed because all the other variabilities are huge and difficult to be teased out to see whether it really causes it or not. Yeah, but the general trend lines are quite clear for all to see. You, you raise something interesting as well for, for, for men in their 40s, which is testosterone levels, right? Correct, yeah. Um, it's a well-known fact that as you get older, your testosterone drops, your, then your motivation levels drop, and you tend to put on weight, and it's, it's counterproductive to your health, right? Indeed. How and why does that happen, and how do you mitigate it? Okay, right. So, what that defines is that what is perceived as a natural decline of testosterone, and what is perceived as a pathological decline of testosterone. 
right? Because what you're highlighting is that you put on weight, you get a bit grumpy, and then you know, grumpy old men. Is that a natural cause of your deterioration, or is that the actual uh, uh, pathological reasons? So, which is chicken and which is egg? Which is the interesting story, right? Okay, so many people who reckons that it's because they are getting older, their testosterone gets weaker, that is lower, and then therefore they become less active, and hence they put on weight, they've got diabetes, they've got high blood pressure, they've got dyslipidemia, and hence they've got metabolic syndrome. But other people will argue that you've got metabolic syndrome to start off with because you are a lazy person, you probably don't exercise as much, you indulge yourself with too much carbohydrate and fat, and you got too... Um, obese and you've got metabolic syndrome and that subsequently reduces your testosterone all right okay a lot of study begin to show that the fat right which is you know the so-called beer bellies actually plays a lot of role in this so when we induce a lot of food then the body actually get desensitized and cannot produce that and then hold so testosterone comes down so either way it is true your testosterone comes down, you actually age faster, and then whenever you abuse your body, you also age faster because your testosterone comes down. The key is to stop that abrupt drop in testosterone. So exercise more, cut down on the uh, carbohydrate and fat when you can, and if you need, then a bit of assistance from testosterone also will help you to break that vicious cycle. Injections, yeah? Injections. Okay, so how do you notice the trend? How do you, notice it? How do you know that if your testosterone is dropping? How do you know? Okay, that can be easily done through a blood test, right? Okay, because the blood test is a, um, easily available in most centers, okay? However, there's a caveat to the blood test. You know, many people will come to my clinic and say, Doc, my testosterone is, um, you know, 7.8. It should be between 11 to 35. Okay. What, what, is the, what, what are the ranges? Okay. The ranges uh, is from 8 to about 32. Right. Okay. But there's several um, caveats to the level. Right. Number one is that the level fluctuates throughout the day. It's called the circadian cycle because our sexual desire, our testosterone, our drive, our hormone and fountain of youth fluctuates on a daily basis. And then it's not just daily, an hourly basis. It's called circadian cycle, right? And it fluctuates according to your state of mind, state of health. So if you're really stressed, it lowers. If you're not as stressed, you'll relax and enjoy a trip in a, a dirty weekend in Langkawi, <laughs> and it's okay, it's high, right? And also, the testosterone is 98% bound to albumin, which is your protein. The true level of testosterone is a free testosterone, which is only 2%. And that is the determinations of the whole drive. That is that fountain of youth. And we can't measure that easily. So therefore, in many ways, to answer your question, in a simple manner, it's a simple blood test to show where is your level. However, Testosterone itself, it's a hormone that determines many, many things. It determines on your mindset, your memory, your sex drive, your bone strength, your heart strength, your musculature. And all that is determined by this fountain of youth. And of course, you want to be loaded with testosterone. I wanted to be loaded with testosterone. I don't want to go through my cycling and my you know, dietary things. I want to cheat. I want to have the testosterone injected into me so that I will feel and look like when I was 18 years old. But there's always a price because higher the amount of testosterone will induce cancerous changes. In the I prostate. see. So the more testosterone that you have, the, the more higher the supra-physiological testosterone, artificial testosterone, artificial will enlarge the prostate. I see. And then that itself stands a risk if you have got BRCA genes or you have got um, risk of getting prostate cancer will may catalyze that process of mutation. So the best way to, is to get it naturally. Absolutely. Keep your weight down, exercise regularly. That's right. Five things perhaps. You know, you sleep more. So adequate sleep. We make our testosterone during REM sleep. And then sleep is a very underappreciated modality of health that people don't talk about. 
Hydration. Hydration is crucially important. Sometimes we can have the whole day of meetings and don't drink, drink enough water. It's not just making stones. Your body source of life comes from hydration, right? Exercise to get the whole circulation going. It's crucial. And then not stress, not worried about Dr. George is going to turn up on time or not, <laughs> and whether he's going to say something naughty or not. That well, he should say me. something naughty. Well, I'm, I'm bound to say something naughty. That's my trademark, right? Okay. <laughs> and whether that put you at edge and that put your testosterone down or not is another issue, right? Okay. And also on top of that, it's all about um, a balanced lifestyle. And those are the things that keep many of our forefathers young, their testosterone going. Because our forefathers, you're from Penang, you know that a lot of our forefathers had many wives. They continue to have sexual, sexually active and continue to still have children. Right into the 60s happen. and 70s. Absolutely. Do we see any of that? Not too much. Okay, society prohibit that a lot. But the thing is that I think the older generations are tougher. I'm sure I, you agree from your shows I th- that, you know. I, th- I think so. I think so. There's a disturbing trend among young people nowadays, falling sick, getting strokes, getting heart attacks. And there are some people who are born in the 30s and 20s, 30s and 40s who are still going strong. Look at Robert Kwok. Yes. He's 90, whatever it is. Yes. Look at Mahathir, right? Exactly. I don't think they got better nutrition than we did they in the modern age. They got poorer nutrition than so, so why do you think these people... Are they outliers or are well, they the I, trend? I, no, I think they are tougher people who went through tough times and then therefore they are resilient. So I started this interview talking about being Kelantanese and I really think that's one of the characters, right? Kelantan seen, seen through many storms of generations of things. And then Penang is another one, Malacca is another kind of areas. And you know that the Penangites are tougher. Tough, tough as, tough as nails, man. Yeah, absolutely. It's because these are the, you know, uh, you guys are the Kiamsia and then the Gu Chalian and that sort of thing. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because you see through tough times and every single sin, every single step, every single breath counts. And that makes tough generations in the past. My children, when things are given to them too easily, it's not a good thing. So when we make so much money and leave it to them, it's not necessarily doing them a favor because they don't feel hungry. They never feel hungry. So they don't have hunger for life. They don't have hunger for health and they don't have hunger for success. And that is probably what defines the Robert Quarks and the millennials. So what's your policy? I'm glad you brought it up because what's your policy towards inheritance and even in terms of how you talk to your children, right? right okay. Do you advise them to do medicine? Uh, what kind of money or legacy do you leave them? Okay. Um, well, well, I, I'm very how hungry can they be okay. if their father is Dr. George? Okay, right. Well, first of all, when your father is Dr. George, number one, never ever live in my shadow and never follow me, right? Okay, don't compete with me because you'll never win. <laughs> right, okay. So, so that's your testosterone talking. Well, not, not necessarily because <laughs> there's only one Dr. George. It's like, you know, obviously, um, obviously. Yeah, obviously. And it's like if you compete with me, you'll never win because I am forever Dr. George and you can never be for Dr. George, right? Okay, right. And then so this is almost like, um, you know, um, the, the whole, it's, it's a prophecy that you're supposed to lose because if you live under my shadow, and if everyone says to you that your father used to do this and your father used to do so that, you can't follow you the can't same follow things. that. It's so, like, you know, I'm chasing my life. So if the children are chasing my life, it's bound to fail. So how, what's your policy towards um, inheritance, okay. for example, right. legacies, right? Okay. All these things. I work on the principles that my parents work hard to pay for my education, right? And that is their unconditional offer to my life. It's a gift. It's a gift that whatever you want to study in life, that I will give you that gift that I will support it regardless. My father, okay, when I got into Cambridge, right, my father went to the GP friend and said, my son got in Cambridge. Can you just check whether there's only one Cambridge? <laughs> right? Because, you know, my dad was somehow, you know, worried that I might end up with like, you know, Oxford Brooks or uh, that sort of like scenario. Not to be disparaging to Oxford Brooks. All right. Okay. But it's not Oxford. No, it's right? not. Okay. Right. Okay. I'm not, but my dad was a bit worried that I might end up in Cambridge Polytechnics. Right. Okay. <laughs> but when he found out, the next thing he asked, 
He said, can I afford this? Well, only after he died, I found out from my mom that he mortgaged everything to make sure that I live my dreams, right? And I think the least responsibility I have towards my kids is that regardless of what my financial situation is, it's not the inheritance that I leave them, it's what I support them now that matters, right? Okay. In fact, the more inheritance that I leave them, actually... Counterproductive. Absolutely. So once they're done and dusted and they enter the workforce, your job is done. Okay. My principle is that I spend the money I make. So I enjoy life. I do what I think is important. I'm chasing the journey now, right? Because, you know, I've said, you're not into the Kung Fu, like, you know, uh, you know there, there is one... Um, have you heard of Sen Tiao Xia Lu? No. Right, okay, right, okay. Um, in, if you are into the um, Chinese uh, Kung Fu Xiao um, Shou uh, novels, right? There are two very famous Kung Fu movies. Like one is from this author called Jing Yong, and then one is called Sen Tiao Xia Lu, the other one is called Se Tiao Ying Song Chuan. And in Sen Tiao Xia Lu, the most, uh, I'm sure you heard in the 70s, the, the famous uh, Andy Lao Yong Kok and Siu Leong Loi. The Four Heavenly Kings. Correct. Well, yeah. no. Uh, well, no, yeah, Andy yeah. Lau and, yeah, Andy yeah. Lau, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. right And in that novel, eventually um, the, uh, the hero becomes Tu Gu Chiu Bai Because he already achieved whatever he wanted to achieve in life So the only thing Chiu Bai means that I'm, he's, only fight, he's only asking to be beaten right? I'm not asking to be beaten I feel like I've done what I needed to do Right, okay if I die, I have my fair shares of adversity in life. I fell off my motorbike. I had robberies in the house that I almost died. I cracked my uh, skull because of that. I went to a concert when people threw the drumstick into the crowd out of 10,000 people or one Republic concert. It hit my eyes. Oh, right? Shit. Okay. So for me, I look at adversities as a gift because a lot of people will ask, why me? Right? And then I will ask, what? how strong it will make me, right? So I am ready to go tomorrow. The only thing I want to go is go without regret. So I can tell you one thing, every day before I go to sleep, I will ask myself one question. Did you waste today? Was there any one minute or one second that you did not do it that will fulfill what you want to do in life? So you've done, you've done the accolade thing, you've done your accomplishment thing, you've done the medical thing, right? You've, you've turned 50, and I know you've been taking pictures in Hawaii and r driving Camaros and whatever. <laughs> um, what's the approach for the next 25 years? Okay, it's very simple. You know, it's a cliche, people say it's not the destination, it's the journey. It's right? not a cliche. Yeah, no. it, it, well, for me, I, I have no idea. Right, that's the best part about coming back to Asia, right? I had a life after 21 years of UK that was planned out for me. When I went to Roy Khan, uh, who was my mentor, my Cambridge boss, and then actually asked him that, look, I, wa I want to go back to Asia, but I'm not sure whether I'm willing to let go of what I've built in the UK, right? You know, I, I had my whole life my whole career pan out and he asked me one simple question what will you be in 30 years time who will you be where will you be i said i'll be you right he said well you're waiting for me to die and then take my place it's true right and he said what fun will it be when you already know where you end up in 20, 30 years time right and then he said where will you be if you had gone back to asia and i said i have no idea I said, then he gave me one advice. In life, there's no if. Because there's no point looking back 30 years from today and say, what, what if? if? Yeah. There's no if. So whatever I want to do now, if I want to run the marathon, you bloody do it now. Because next year, your knees might not be able to take it anymore. Okay? So when I go to Hawaii, if I need to dive with the... Um, the, um, the whales, if I want to go and see the turtle lay, if I want to climb the volcano, it's not because, my daughter said, you're doing this for the Instagram worthiness. No. 
I'm doing this because I still can. Yeah. And all the things are the things that I never did because I was focusing on my career. And I've done the, all that. I've paid for all your education and all that. Now, are they finished already? Both your children? Um, nearly. Yeah. One is second year of um, um, you know LSE. The other one is about to go into um, a career in mathematics in university. So that's a good thing because don't follow your dad's footstep, right? Because this person is already taken. This competition is already taken. Find your own life. Find your journey. Because I'm finding mine. It's a cliche, I know. But I just want to say to myself, it's not for us, someone else. I'm doing it, the whole Instagram thing, truthfully, as a record. It's a re recollection for myself. Okay, so I want to ask you this, this is a bit of a digression as well, because you just said your daughter's an LSE, one, one is in pursuing mathematics, right? Mm -hmm. How do you, what is the secret to producing high-performing children when the parents themselves, um, when they have not come from a position of, of adversity? Okay. Because when you're not struggling, you're not achieving, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if things are too easy, then you're not going to try and work hard, right? Okay. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the common malaise. Well, to, to be truthful, I think the two things that contributed towards that. If they had stayed back in the UK, they would never be in a position that they're in at the moment. Because in the UK, you get beaten up whenever you are a, a smart aleck. Okay, so they were born in the UK. They were born in the UK, but came back to Asia. With you. Yeah. Uh, with me. Uh, when one was seven years old, when, when the other one was five. One of the best things that they grow up in uh, Malaysia and also in Asia is that it's sexy when you're intelligent. Yeah, right? it's not okay. so when you're in the UK. That's right. When you really get beaten up, if you ask questions or if you're the pe teacher's pet, right? Yeah. Right? And you pretend you're stupid. Yeah. Right? You pretend that you get drunk and you throw up everywhere because it's, that is perceived as it's sexy. crazy, but that's true. Over here, if you're a teacher's pet, gosh, you know, you are sexy. You know, you're, all hot the girls shit, are, yeah. you're hot shit, right? Okay. <laughs> Am I allowed to say shit? Yeah, right. Sure, okay, sure. right, okay. So, so that is one cultural upbringing that transformed them. One thing. The other thing, I really want to take this opportunity to say that my wife really was doing all that nurturing when I was uh, focusing on my career and uh, my making the money to, to sustain this. Because all that you know, effort that your um, mother put you through, the tuition classes, wait outside, you know, uh, and, and making sure that your homework is done, the rotan out and all that, was still happening to my kids. Even though it's not trendy, but now the fruit, it's fantastic, right? But for guys who... Were they predisposed to hard work and uh, achievement or did they transform from being quite lazy to being no, quite hard working? No, 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 no. I think they thrive on that whole idea of, you know, now I'm number one in the class, I want to do better and that sort of thing. Some people blame their parents and say, this is what you want, this is not what I want. Right? But on the other hand, I don't know. Eventually, they'll blame their parents. We blame our parents for everything anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. They will. But the thing is that at least you get to blame for the good things and the bad things, right? But the other things that, while I'm on this subject, for guys, for you and me, you, you've got kids in that age group that are about to venture into the um, teenage years. Two pieces of advice I want to give you, right? Number one is that when your wife takes that role of nurturing them and your wife making the money and that sort of thing, you need to upset at some point that you're, you might be a bit distant with them. Although you might be, you know, now playing footballs together and that sort of thing, because you have to, you cannot take away from the facts that your wife spent more time with them and you don't spend as much time with them. So don't feel so gutted whenever you feel like she gets more of the attention when they grow up, they're closer, right? That's number one. And number two, one advice for parents is to let go, right? I really think this is important. So don't feel so hurt because eventually they need to let go. Either at the age of 13, they will just say, Dad, you know, thanks for everything, but I need to fly my own, uh, you know, ship now. It can happen at the age of 13 or it can happen at the age of 33, right? Whenever it happens, it's going to hurt. Right? Especially Chinese parents who feel like they invest so much because in many ways, we treat this as a transaction. We put in so much and you treat me like this. I really think that you have to do it unconditionally and say, okay, 
it hurts, but you get it, it hurts earlier, it's better than it hurts later. Yeah, just to say, but you're not that far from your, you're not that distant from your children, are you? Um, well, in a way, physical distance is a distance, emotional yeah. distance is a distance, and in a way, I'm ready for them just to fly solo. I want them to fly solo, because, yeah. you know, in a British uh, household, at the age of 18, you're kicked they've out gone, of the house, yeah, right? They've gone, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Right. They're expected so to leave. In a way, I want that to happen. Also, in a way, I still want to pamper them to make sure that the whole main things is available or they don't have to do their dishes and that sort of thing. But all that support is artificial. They need to be in real life. They need to feel the hunger. So to answer your questions, in a way, it comes to a point when you let go, you really let go. And sink or swim, you hope that they learn all the life skills. And one thing that I say to the kids, whatever you do, you fall. You fall bad and you climb out of it again. Because what we're creating is this bubble wrap that when you fall, it doesn't hurt. That's, not, that's bullshit, that's not real life. It's not real life because our whole journey of um, providing them the financial securities, the all emotional security, all the mom and dad is here. It's not real life. When they fall, it doesn't hurt. When I say to them, you fall and you fall fast, you fall earlier in life and you learn how to climb out that hole because it's going to hurt. The more it hurts, the more you remember not to fall in the same hole again. The steeper the learning curve. Okay, let, let's, play, let's play fast questions, okay? Fast questions, so fast question, fast answer, right? Uh, how would you advise the 31-year-old person in terms of career choice? Medicine or not medicine? Not medicine. Why not medicine? Because... Short uh, answers. Okay. Um, you don't think out of the box in medical field. In a way, it's a hierarchy. It's a safe subject. Think out of, med uh, out of the box first and then go into medicine later. Most important skill for a 31-year-old person to have today? Um, being adaptable. Right, okay, so you need to, I mean, it's a cliche to say work hard, but the world is changing. Adapt, adapt, adapt. No matter how the world is changing, you need to find your role to adapt to that changing world. Because the world is changing so fast, adaptable is one key word. Five pieces of advice for the middle-aged man. Number one, <laughs> okay, right, okay, don't feel gutted. Right, okay, right. So, so a lot of things, no, don't look back. Don't regret, don't, no regrets, yeah. no regrets. Okay. Whatever happened, you can't change it, right? Okay, so no regrets, okay? Number two, love yourself, right, okay? For all those Prada shoes that you wanted to buy or all the Gucci things that you wanna buy because you save all that money so that your kids can have it and you buy the outlet stuff, for a change, buy the full price things for yourself, right? Not the kids just having it, buy the full price things for yourself, right? So that's number two. Right. Number three, love yourself so that you look after yourself. Don't abuse your body You're anymore. You look very good yourself, George. I know. I know <laughs> that. Right. I can see that every day. I tell myself I look great. But it's because if I feel like I want to wear a suit today, I wear suit. I wear like this every day to work. Right. People say, "What's the weather? What's it? I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for me. If I know I look good in blue, I look good in Gucci. I will wear Gucci. I wear whatever I feel good in, not determined by you, determined by me." I play by my rules, right? Number four. Number four, for a change, know what you want, right? Okay. For years and years, you adapt to your children. The children like Japanese food, you adapt to that Japanese food, right? Okay. But sometimes you lose your identity. You have no idea what you enjoy anymore. When they leave home, you have no idea what's your hobby. You have no idea what food you like. So at some point, you know, go back to the things. I love Chakwe Tiao and I love, you know, um, you know, uh, wonton mee. The kids don't like it, but for years I've been eating Japanese, but I hate Japanese. <laughs> right? Fantastic. Okay. Number five, right? It's never too late. So for emotional uh, side, for physical side, for relationship, so, like, so your emotional side, you think, ah, oh, it's too late already, you know. Uh, you know, I am already at this stage, you know, it's like my career, it's like too late already. So no such thing. There's no such thing as being too late. 
So for the physical side, you say I'm already out of shape. Like if Dr. George can be 108 kilo and suddenly get into like 78 and then feel sexy, hey, you can be sexy, okay? It's never too late, right? Okay, if he can have the pecs and he can have the bulk and he can have the muscle, you can have it, right? It just needs hard work because you haven't had the hard work for 50 years. It's about time you get on those uh, treadmills and then do the hard work. What is the definition of wealth? Okay, well, n- number three, and let me finish that. Okay. The last thing, right? Okay. Okay. Reconcile with a lot of issues in the past. If you have problems with your parents and everything, let go. Don't, don't, don't actually hold back. Don't have bad feelings because when you forgive and when you let go, you actually gain more. Definition of wealth, um, it has to come in three forms. Wealth of health, health is wealth. So if you're feeling healthy, no matter how poor your bank account is, you're already rich. Okay, number one. That's why people pray for, right? Health first. And that's true. Because you can have all the bank account in the world, but if you can't walk, you're on wheelchair, equals nothing. Okay, so that's number one. It's health, right? Number two, it's emotional wealth, right? So the emotional wealth, it's love yourself, love the people around you. And number three, appreciate every breath that you take. And that wealth, it's overwhelming. So it's, it's not about what you haven't got. It's about things you already have and appreciate it. Because we chase for things we don't have, but yet we don't appreciate things we already have. Look around you. The wealth is already around you. Why chase for things you don't get and you will never feel wealthy? Amazing, Dr. George. I've been uh, gobsmacked by your, I hope so. <laughs> by your <laughs> advice and insights. Thank you ever so much My absolute for pleasure. your time. Come see ya. Beep, huh? Eo? Eo, hold